Because if you don't know who I am, and you don't know where I'm from, and I'm giving you advice that you start executing, very dangerous. So, normally what I ask, and I'll ask in a second, I want you to verify by asking me a few questions if I actually know what I'm talking about. Because that could otherwise be in a dangerous situation. Now, we differentiate between three kinds of people when they stand in front of you. A person who reads or writes a book but actually has never done it. A blog poster, a poster, they generally repost things, number one. Number two, a person who's done it once, maybe twice, and speaks from personal experience. Often valid advice, but got to be understood in context. And then number three, a person who does it repeatedly, has done it serially or does it again like an expert. You need to determine from me which one of these three I am. And I ask you to do that because in today's world it's really hard to find out. So, why don't we ask, which question would you like to ask me to figure out which one of these three I am? Give me your best sales tips. Give me my best sales tips. Tip. My best sales tip is to not sell. If you want to learn how to sell, you essentially have to stop selling. Because people hate being sold. They don't hate it a little bit. No, they hate it with a passion. Think of yourself. Do you like to be sold? So the first thing that you need to do is stop selling. What people love to do is they love to buy. So why don't we start helping them to buy instead of sell? And that is one of the first big things that I want to let you know. The tip is to stop selling and help people to buy. Next person. Anybody else want to ask me anything? Verify if I know what I'm talking about. How to migrate to enterprise to sell to SME? This lady asked how to migrate from enterprise sales to SMB. Now, there's in many cases, we see two directions from sales. We see a direction in the change in the pricing model, and we see a change in the direction of where you're going to go to per market. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about changing from a market. I'm selling from the enterprise market to the SMB market. Now, the enterprise market generally is based on high dollar value, low volume deals. And the SMB market in general is low dollar value, high uh, dollar, uh, sorry, low volume, high dollar value. It's reversed. What we see is radically different between enterprise sales and SMB sales. That enterprise sales is pretty much superstar slash people driven. You hire really good people that already know the market because they got to establish a relationship with these really good customers that you're looking for. Enterprise selling, big dollar value, 9 to 18 months often, 6 to 9 months in SaaS. These people need to be trained, and you hire people who already know the market and who have the network. On the SMB market, it is volume. And when we switch to volume, anything that we do in volume in the world requires a factory, requires a certain process. We now move from a people's uh, uh, approach to a process approach. Now, if I have four enterprise reps working for me, and two of them don't hit quota, and I miss my number, who am I going to blame? The two who weren't there. The two who missed. I blame the people. If I have 60 salespeople, and 30 of them are not performing, I can't blame the 30 people. I have to blame the process. This switch of people-oriented to process-oriented is the switch between enterprise and SMB. On the seller's perspective, if I am selling product, and what we traditionally see is that SMB buys product and expects the service for free, and enterprise buys the service and expects the product for free. If you think of it that way, it tells you what the importance is of a professional service organization when we start talking about selling to the enterprise. So we're in the middle of an ask me anything, so let's, uh, another question. Anyone else want to ask something? Yes, sir.
Yes. One hand design, on the other hand storytelling, right? So you are a representative of winning by design. What would you say? How do we combine storytelling into this? We have two things here. Question and again, two things: design and storytelling. How do they correlate with each other? How does one resonate with the other? Yes or no? Now. What we have with design is a form of a process. In design, I set up as a way on how I'm going to solve my problem. Whereas storytelling is a very specific action I am using during the execution of my process. One of the, ex one of the parts of a sales process, somewhere along the line, I have to share a use case story. And when I share that use case story, I need to develop and deliver the, the skill of storytelling. Therefore, storytelling and design are not mutually exclusive. One fits within the other. Now, storytelling I can do in multiple places. At first, I can storytell about my vision, an activity I take, uh, that takes place early on. In the middle, I can have a storytelling about how my clients are using me. And towards the end, I can have a storytelling of the sales cycle. I can have a storytelling about the benefits and gains and why I picked a particular company three different stories that need to be told to the customer. We know that with customers, it doesn't resonate if you just give facts and figures. And that's why we need storytelling. Storytelling is a way on how I can help you remember something that otherwise you would not have as easily remembered. Okay? Great. You're most welcome. Last one up. Last question. Yes, sir. Say that again, what should you do? During enterprise negotiation, what is one of the worst things you can do? During any negotiation, the worst thing that you can do is giving discount without asking something in return for it. Because essentially, you devalued your product. It's one of the worst things because there are you know, many things that come into my mind that are worst things, but that really is a bad one. And so what we find in many cases, that if we start thinking about um, how we're going to discount, that we need to stop the thought of discounting. And that is perhaps a good place to start for today's conversation. Now, with the, with the group that we have, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a little bit of a whiteboard session and interactive. You probably need to raise your hand. And uh, if you raise your hand, Renata in the back will call out that somebody raised their hand and she will let me know. So if I'm writing on a whiteboard, what we need to do is we need to make sure that you have, n have no fear of asking, okay? That is the thing about it, because, about it, because the fear of asking is essentially resulting in the fear of failing. Now, there's three topics that we're going to talk about in a brief order. These are the three things that I spoke about yesterday in a different format, but these are the three things that for 2019 are things I would like you to consider. Number one, work smarter, not harder. Smarter, not harder. Number two, are we leveraging the female part of our organization on executive level? And number three, are we really enabling our young generation to become successful. Three topics. These three topics, I'll give you examples of why and how we need to do certain things and what we can do with it as we move forward. First things first. I'm going to give you an example of work smarter, not harder. I've been raised in a generation and my generation has been taught to work harder. If you want something, go get it, work harder. Therefore, if I was uh, told, you know what, like, Jocko, you need to double your sales, I need to work twice as hard. I need to hire twice as many salespeople. I need to hire, get twice as many leads. I need to do everything twice as much, maybe double the price. But to double things overnight is really, really difficult. You cannot just double your price on the product. Say, so there you go, let's see. Let's see if we double our sales. That ain't going to work. You cannot just go to marketing and say, marketing, can you give me twice as many leads? 
Well, you're going to get twice as many leads, only the quality is going to be less different. So you're going to have a challenge with that. So how are we going to double? We need to think about it differently. Now, traditionally, traditionally, what I, what I do when I'm in sales, I add things up. I can say channels. Let's say I have a $10 million number. doesn't matter. ARR, MRR, pineapples, it doesn't matter. Let's say I'm going to say t pineapples. I'm going to get out of pineapples, $4 million. I need to make this add up to 10 I'm going to have out of my direct sales team in the U.S., I'm going to have $2 million. LATAM, $3 million. When I add up, that adds up to nine. Let me say, oh, I have a gap that I need to fill of one million. I add this up, it gets me to 10. I'm looking at leads, do the same thing. I need 2,000 leads, MQLs, SQLs, doesn't matter at this point. I need 2,000 leads. Where am I going to get them from? Hmm. I'm going to get 400 from a trade show. I'm going to get 1,000 from SEO. I'm going to get 12, uh, 200 from an event. Right? I'm going to look at that. That's why I'm adding them up. I keep adding these things up. However, if we look at what sales actually does, what, what in SaaS actually is happening, if I have a deal that is progressing from one situation to another, and let's say I go from prospects to MQL to SQL, I'll abbreviate these terms in a second. This is progression of leads, SAL and win. Let's say I progress through these steps. Prospects can be people in the phone book minus exclusions such as schools or something like that. MQL, marketing qualified lead. A person has taken a look at it, some action may have been taken, some website activity has occurred. SQL, sales qualified lead. Sales, S. Customer actually wants to talk to a sales professional in one form or another. Sales accepted lead. Sales says yes. Potential to, op to an opportunity here. I can see how we can turn this into a pipeline, essentially resulting in a win. What I do down here is if I have a thousand prospects, constantly I am multiplying. Thousand times 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 times times times. What SaaS is about is multiplying. It's not all about adding, it's a system. It's not an independent silo. Once you understand and you're going to give in to that, what I can say, maybe doubling this to $2,000 is not, 2,000 leads is not realistic. But is it realistic to increase this 20% to 22%? Is it realistic to make this 30%, 33%, and this 40%, 44%? That seems to be realistic instead of 20% 22. That is a lift of 10%. What we have found is if you make, if a 10% lift, a lift of 10%, 1.1 to the power of 7 equals 2x. The truth of SAS doesn't lie and I need to do more of something. The truth of SAS lies, am I optimizing my product efficiently? that it goes increased by 10%. It is not about the capacity, it's about the efficiency of the engine. What most founders and early startups misunderstand is they design their company on a volume capacity based model and at the end they run out at two, three, four, five, ten million dollars in revenue because the capacity driven model just simply ain't enough leads in the world if you look in, in their universe to keep supplying the system. And so they run out. With most customers that we deal with, in the B2B world, platform sales, they have 5,000 customers. It doesn't care what your TAM says. We work with Adobe, 5,000 customers. We work with Google, 5,000 customers for a particular market, particular product. That's it. And everybody says, no, there's 100,000 X and 100,000 Y. Yes, where are they? In which zip code? Do you have salespeople there? Do you speak the language? If you really look at it, it's no, no, no. Okay, so really what we have left is and it comes somewhere, you know, like at most seven, eight thousand, but somewhere between five and eight thousand. That's it. 
That's what most enterprise selling a platform focus on. Now, you do that by 10% improvement because I can't keep chopping at thousands of leads that sooner or later start chopping down the machine. This is all about working smarter, not harder. Before I go on, any questions on this? Now you see, no, you know what I'm dealing with, right? I'm like, oh, 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 but I have something for this. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to ask you to, in the next 30 to 60 seconds, look at the person to your left and the right. You got to talk with each other and come up as a group one or two questions that you're going to ask me. Talk to each other and come up with a question. You got 30 to 60 seconds, and then I'm going to come back to you and we're going to ask one more time. Ask me a question. Okay, ready, set, go. 30, 60 seconds. Ask a question. You're talking about SaaS companies, right? Um, did you ever uh, work with, uh, with uh, high-touch uh, companies or enterprises? Sure. Yeah, tell me about your inside sales experience. <laughs> Okay, That's yeah. my thing. Um, Great. Okay. What do you sell? What is it? What is the price of your product? Uh, I'm a fintech. Sure. Yeah. But what, what is the price of your product? Uh, I have no price. I'm. I'm, I'm a credit. Uh, okay. Fintech. Okay. So you have a credit fintech. You run credit card transactions. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. And so when you run credit card transactions, how much do you make of a customer annually a year? Sorry. How much do you make of the customer? Uh, $100, no. Okay. Let's go. There we go. I'll come back to your question later on, ma'am. Okay. See, look at that, right? Okay, let's see. Does anybody want to ask me a question? There we go. Okay. <laughs> go for it. And you second. And the question is, is it easy one or the other easier? Okay, good question. So if I, have, if I have to choose, I can increase the amount of leads and increase the amount of uh, the conversion rate. What is more important? What I'm going to tell you first is that you need to have the leads in order to prove the conversion rate because otherwise I have nothing to convert on, right? I need you know, the chicken and the egg. In this case, it's clear. I need to have the leads first. But what you find is that you cannot keep going and looking for these leads into infinity. Now, at the most of the companies, the mistake that they make is that they essentially, when they look for the, uh, for the volume of deals, they look for the wrong kind of quality in the first place, which essentially impacts the conversion rate downstream. And so if I want to improve the efficiency and the volume, what we found is you calculate it out, since it's a conversion rate and a price, you can quickly, with some basic Excel spreadsheet, come to the conclusion what is better. And here's what we find out. Most people, most organizations are looking for a group of customers that are a fit. And that fit in generally is something like, hey, look, it's this world, this circle, and this triangle. It's the title of a person, the size of the company, and, and this could be number of people, and it could be the dollar value or something like that. And so when they do that, and when they focus on that, they say, Jocko, I need, I need this piece down here. I need the overlap of the title, the, the size, and, and the, the amount of revenue that they have. Maybe public information, let's say that that's the case. And then they're going to call me up. And when they're going to call me up, they say, Jocko, I noticed that you are this person at that company. You have this amount of revenue and this amount of people. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Why am I talking to you? I don't want to talk to you. Why am I talking to you? Why? You look me up because I was a fit. Combine this with volume-based outbound, 
In other words, I'm going to talk thousands of people, and I quickly come to the conclusion that everybody that I'm targeting is a fit. What I'm using to make sure and they identify they have a pain is my inside sales organization. These people now have to start calling up the customer, overcome the objection, and do some groundwork on what the pain is. Well, using manual power can be very ineffective and inefficient. We know that it's not the right time. You call them up and say like, oh, may I learn a few things more from you before I start selling to you? I don't know about you, but I don't find that a lot of people are very interested in doing that. You're not willing to just talk to a wild stranger to tell them what your pains are. So what you should do in this case, you should first focus on what are the customers that actually have a pain and then go find new prospects that mimic that customer. Now in this case, I mean many, in, some ties, in some cases, I give the example of a tire company. A tire company sells tires. So every car out there is a fit. Every car needs tires. It's a fit. Now how do I find the ones that have a pain? Now, in here, I would love to have the ones, when I need to buy a new set of tires, I need companies that have worn, worn thread. The tires are worn. Now I can have, manually, somebody who walks the streets. Yeah, that one has no thread. That one has no thread. That one has no thread. I can do that. Some cases, that's a very effective way. It's fine. If you can make it efficient in the dollars, that can be a really good opportunity if you sell into a small area. Or I can start working smarter. And so what you see, for example, if we were in the mountains, in this case, I can look at a car and say you have a ski rack on top of it, which indicates that you're going to go into the mountains. Because you're going to go into the mountains, when you stop by, and see that you have worn thread because you're looking for something. I can say, like, I noticed that your thread is worn. Are you headed to the mountains? Yes. I noticed that you have a kid seat in the back. Did I get that right? Yes, I got a kid seat in the back. So you have kids, you're going to the mountains. What I caution you is that your thread is too worn, and before you go next trip, buy the next set of tires. The customer has a pain. What we see that is a pure, innate lack of knowledge combined with laziness, and it's, there's no excuse for it, it's pure laziness. Not lazy as in, oh, I'm lazy to do it. It's lazy to figure it out in many cases, is you need to build... The first step to selling well is that your thought needs to be, I need to build the world's best database on prospects and which pain they have. And for that, I can use all kinds of low-cost resources. The way how we do that is, I go to a screen and I say to someone, to one of your salespeople, hey, how do you find out if this customer, in I use a web interface right now, okay? I'm on a, web, on, a, on a web browser. You tell me, what do you look for in a, a customer to be a good fit? Oh, I go to the website. Okay, go to the website. Click on this. Click on that. Do this. Check here. Look for that. We record that in like a three, four, five minute video. Then we go to a lower cost workshop. We say, can you put 10 people on this for the next two weeks? Here's 5,000 leads. Can you check out which pain they have? Fill out this column. Repopulate the database with the updated information. Let us select from that which we're going to go after. And now my call is no longer, hi, I know that you're this size, this title, and this dollar. Now the performance, I noticed on your website that you're indicating that you have this problem. Did I get that right? I have a different conversation. This is the, the idea of what has gone wrong and gone right. If I do this right up the front, I'm essentially adjusting my leads volume down, knowing that the conversion rate is going to go up. I know that because I'm already selecting it. Therefore, it is not necessarily that the volume of leads is the most important to me. It's the quality and the volume of the leads that comes first and foremost. And the best ones you can find are looking after your customers first. Okay. That's number... Uh, that's the, uh, next question. Sorry, next question. Oh, you were number two. I forgot. Yes. And I got you number three. The conversion rate, uh, the question is, if I have a conversion rate, is working on the funnel everywhere equally of interest? And the answer to that is yes. 
If I just draw the funnel here, the first part of the funnel, and let's say I got a bunch of activities, this is a linear transaction. So if I improve 10% here, this exactly equate to the 10% down here, right? We know that. One of the quickest things we show is like, where is there some easy maneuvering in creating some quick 10% improvement? Down here, the quickest play to improve are essentially, I'm going to give you four key moments that we found are really, really good. One I just told about, go after customers who are a pain, not those who are a fit. Number two, conversation, not qualification. Qualify is not the right thing. Number three, diagnose, not pitch. And number four, trade, not negotiate. If I see what in generally we do, we go after customers who are, who, who are a fit, we qualify on what we can sell to them, we then pitch the solution and then we negotiate it out. Like most sales training is focused on that. And it's, these are all the wrong things. When I started winning my deals, I actually never, ever, ever, as a customer told me like, Jocko, man, the reason I bought for you because your negotiation skills were really awesome. Like, I really liked your negotiation skills. That's why I bought from you. They don't say that. They don't say like, the, when you pitched, oh my God, your pitch deck, slide four on your pitch deck blew me away. Like, maybe occasionally you get a care like, hey, your pitch was really cool. But across all your customers, you don't constantly hear that, you know, your pitch deck is great. What we have forgotten is we assist the sales process rather than, or assist the buy process rather than the sales process, that the first thing that we need to learn is how to have a conversation. Now. In this conversation, what it is about is about listening to customer and listening to what they're saying rather than you starting to talk. The conversation needs to be twofold. What we, however, have found over the years that is that there's an inherent nature that is a difference between marketing and sales. It's not bad or good or whatever it is. It is just an inherent difference. The inherent difference is that marketing comes from a non-communicative tool that's, that is one-way communication. Sorry, not, it's a one-way communicative tool. A billboard. If you go back, it's a paper that is written. Marketing is not two ways. It's not like, oh, the billboard starts speaking back to me. Or the, when I open up the leaflet from 50 years ago, suddenly there's a 3D thing popping out that I can engage with. Marketing was not invented over that. On the other perspective, sales was invented to do one-to-one -one conversation. If I go back 50 to 100 years, you actually had to meet the person to sell to the person. You had to have that conversation. So one is very one-way driven and the other is very two-way driven. We fumble them together in today's world and we start to see the problem. Our two-way conversational specialists are embracing one-way email communicative tools without building a conversation. We're using marketing-based with bulleted items, topics, and we say send it to them, which is a marketing kind of awareness tool. And it doesn't generate any conversation. And that's right. It wasn't intended. It wasn't designed. It didn't do that way. We call that sales. Some cases we call that inside sales. Folks, that's not selling. That's just humanoid spam mail. We're just creating email robots. All these smart people that we put are now turning into email robots. What we need to learn in our form is communication. Now, for example, what we see today, many of you may already have this. If we look we are starting to use content as our outbound. Content serves with its primary purpose to drive people to your website. Why? Content skills really well at low cost when written and done properly. Now when I say content, I don't mean it has to be a 16 page document. It could be. It could be a tweet. It could be whatever, a video. It could be whatever you want it to be. Content can come in many shapes and forms. But the objective of the content is drive the people to the website. Now what do I put on my website? I put some live chat. We see the ongoing uh, success putting an online chat right there on the website. What happens with that chat? Hey, who is managing the chat? Is that our smartest person? No, we just hired a new kid and he's going to join in. He can manage the chat. He can chat, you know, talk to the kids. Okay, 
The kid goes like, dude, uh, what do I do? There's four questions. Do they have budget? Are they the authority? Do they need it right now? Do they have a timeline? Chat, open up. Hi, uh, thank you for stopping by. Good. He, he or she knows, you know, wants it to start off well. May I ask, um, why are you contacting us? No, I was looking for a solution. Are you the decision maker? No. Are you the budget owner? No. Um, okay, well, maybe we can help you. What we see today, and I dare you, go to the website. Most chats are simply covered forms of band. That's not a conversation, that's qualification. These people made it through your content, which we invested in. They then went to your website, which took them at time and effort. And the first thing they do, they hit the lowest person on our totem pole. The, not because of, it's not the lowest, the least educated person on the totem pole. Let's call it like that. The least educated person on the totem pole. And he's there to catch our million dollars of marketing and sales that we invested at that point, And that's the weakest link. This doesn't happen once or twice. This happens again and again and again. And then we go, it's like, well, let's test out if this robot thing works. Now we put some AI on it. We give the bot a funky name, cool picture. Like, look at this, this is going to work, right? And then they stop doing it because nobody's responding with the funky named email robot that is asking them for an email address so they can send them some material. And it happens again and again and again. Now, what we find is that the scaling of that conversation is really good. So in this case, I would teach or we would recommend that you develop your SDRs, you develop conversational skill via chat. Here's a conversational skill. The person behind the chatbot enters a simple emoticon, smiley faced. Customer doesn't respond with an emoticon. He or she may try one more time an emoticon, a heart. Customer doesn't respond with an emoticon. Okay, people. Clearly, this Dutsky is not interested in emoticon exchange. So let's stop and let's drop down on, the, on, the, on that form of the conversation, right? That is a form of conversation. I'm looking if the person mirrors my language. Not just tone and vibration, I'm also looking at emoticons, words. If the, if the person asks me and I say, like, what can I help with? You have to sit next to them. You have to role play with each other. You have to learn this. If not, this is not going to go work. Diagnose. Last one on this is trade and negotiate. Folks, I just want to let you know that your people, in general, your sales teams, are unable to negotiate. You can tell me all you want. Oh, they're in sales. They must be able to negotiate. None. It is very rare that we run into a sales team that actually we think that we come to the conclusion they can actually negotiate. Now here's what you do in order to determine if, if a sales team can negotiate. At the end of the quarter, the month, whatever, it, whatever uh, you, you, you look at, you have let's say 10 deals, 20 deals, 100 deals. You look for percentage discount given. When we see this, we clearly know there's no negotiating happening here. We're giving away 20% almost flat rate in most cases up front. Now I know that I need to culturally adjust this to your local culture, but we find is that discounts are given away like that on the first call. Now what we found is I'm not a, we don't have a problem with that you're adjusting the price. That's quite fine. Adjusting the price is not the problem. What we have a, what we have a problem with is that the amount that you do it with are round numbers and generally measured in, in tens. Like 10%, 20%, 30%, something like that. 25%, 50%, 20%. Like later on in SaaS, we're trying to reduce our churn from 8% to 7%. And my salespeople up front, they're giving 10%, 5% away right from the get-go. That's a problem. And so what we see down here, what we can do, each of these need to be split up. So what we can say is 4% for a new referral. If you refer us to a new customer, if you introduce us to a new prospective client, we give you 4%, maybe two, whatever it is. If, we, if you do a tweet about us, we give you like 3%. So you give shorter, smaller things. We create a trade list with that. That trade list is put in front of your salespeople. That salespeople look at the list and they say, well, I know you want, but maybe can you do a tweet? Can you do this? Can you do that? 
Now, if a customer keeps saying, no, I cannot do that, 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 maybe it's time for you to say, well, look, I've given you all these opportunities to adjust the price. Maybe I should start taking away some of my product. Maybe I should take away like an extra functionality or something like that. It's quite fair. You can't keep saying, I'm going to give you, give you, give you, give you, and not get anything back. This is called a trade. That's a trade list. I trade X for Y. Now, when we look at these things, we have four different points. First gut reaction. Where do you think is the, since all of them work in a linear basis. So reducing by 10% each of these or improving by 10% each of these, from a math perspective, it's exactly right. Doesn't matter. This is a multiplication. Which one of these four seems to be the easiest to start? Discount. Now, that applies to your business. What I want all of you now to think to yourself, oh, he said discount. Is it discount? No, I do not know your business. I do not know if you give these discounts. Discount in this case is the right one because you see it. But I do not know for you. For him, it's the right thing. You've got to learn to trust the math. Look at the math here. Look at the metrics. Figure out where your metric and where your break point is. Because I can teach you that the math is right. What I can teach you is that the discount is the right solution for all of you. Make sense? Last person, last question, the person in the blue shirt. Yes. Uh, how do you find your, how do you estimate your process when your process of, uh, in, uh, of finding the conversion rate does not apply to your business? Specifying it when your client, aka the one who benefits from your service, is not the one who pays you. Now, Channel. Yes. Okay. So in this case, we have an in. What well, this is all involves direct sales. What if we have indirect sales? So an indirect sale is something like this. And as the gentleman described it, we may have a patient in healthcare. This patient has a financial transaction down here, and in there there may be a form of a channel. The channel can be a reseller channel, but the channel can also be a strategic channel. Can be a systems integrator. So what you now see, right? This is what we're talking about, right? Yeah. And so what we see down here, this is you. And you need to, need, need to work with, with, with these folks. Now, in this case, what you find in indirect, in his indirect form, if you sell to them and they sell to do, may I ask for many of you, I, I assume that by a raise of hands, uh, for whom is uh, finding customers a challenge? By a raise of hands. Show me if your hands, if you have a hard time raising uh, finding customers. Okay, so a few. What we find is like, hey, finding customers is really a challenge right here. The channel, when they pitch your service, they are going to have an even harder time pitching your service than your own sales team have because they don't do it day in, day out. And so the first thing that you got to do here in order to make all this work, discount is not going to be impacted by this because they do what they do. What is going to impact here is the education education on one of three things. Now, I'm going to draw what are the key things, three key challenges. By the way, I'm reducing the scope of the agenda a little bit because the questions are good, so I want to just keep going on the questions and the, uh, uh, as we go. There is three things that we need in sales. First of all, we need to understand the problem that the customer is having. Second of all, we need to understand the solution that we're selling. If I now have a solution to the problem, I have an opportunity to sell something. Now, in order to understand the problem, I need to understand the market. In order to understand the solution, I need to understand the product. Now, which person in the company knows really well from early on what the problem is and what the solution is? Which person knows the market well, the product well, the problem and the solution well? Early on. The founder. The founder. This we call founder-led sales. The founder sells. And as the founder sells, they don't need sales skills. And they look at the sales team that they hire later on like, dude, I don't know about you, but uh, if I can sell this stuff, why can you not sell that stuff? Well, I can tell you why I can sell that stuff. 
because I didn't work 20 years of my life in that industry before I started the product, and I didn't write the code, half the code of that product myself. So I actually don't know what I, the product or the market. But what I do know is I know how to sell. And what I need from you is this little bit of information on the solution and the problem, because I don't need 20 years of experience to get to that same conclusion. What we see down here is founder-led sales actually constricts future sales because the domain knowledge that they acquired from a process perspective can never be taught to the salesperson. You can't teach that in 20 years. You can hire a person like that, enterprise sales, that's where you hire these people. Or you can teach people like that, subset, SMB sales. Now this nature, what we see down here, what does the channel know really well? Well, look, the channel should know the market really well. That's, the, that's why you bought that channel in the meta text space. You know the channel very well. So I have to assume at this point, that's not necessarily the case, but at this point, I have to assume that they know how to sell. And so what you've got to educate them on is really well on the product. And I don't mean the rational details of the product, oh, feature X, spec Y. I mean the emotional details. Here's how th we change people's life. Here's how this works. The storytelling come back in, comes back into play. I need to really deliver this value through story. Now, this is the difference between when you have a non-enabled channel, you don't have that, and you just give them a price list, and you just give them a uh, um, uh, few sales uh, features, be uh, benefits, and spec points. Now, what that channel is going to do, they're going to try to sell it to the market, but they don't know the story. They're essentially becoming a half-operating founder. What we do in many cases, and what I give you a few practical examples with, is when you're in that phase of founder-led sales, how do, heck do you get out of it? Because often it says founder-led sales, then it comes to first salesperson, get rejected by the founder after six months because, you know, the dude can't scale, or after a year, like, the dude can't sell, the dude that's cannot sell doesn't know what they're talking about. I know. It's not that they can't sell, they just don't know this, right? So now what we need to do is we need to find how can we get the right people. Now, here's what you do. Essentially, when you're that person, when you're part of that organization, where you're the founder, you're the first led salesperson, you're the first uh, something like this, there's a very basic trick. And those of you in product design are going to love this because it's very so simple that you go like, ah, I can do this. I'll take a customer. And uh, let me say that the uh, customer is Kubo. Now, Kubo on the web has... No? Well, good, yeah. Okay, let me pick another one. I'm not taking Kubo. <laughs> I'm pick, give me a customer name, so a large company. Starbucks. No, that's too large. I need a, a relevant customer. <laughs> and in a second, you understand why. Else. Give me a name of a local customer. Kahul, oh, whatever. Kahul. I make it up. Kahul. I don't even know how to read it. Kahul.com. Okay. Okay. So I write Kahul. Okay. Now Kahul is my customer. I look up the website, and Kahul on the website has Kahul.com. Right? I know that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go into my email server, and I'm going to do a root search in email. In other words, just do a Google search in email on Kahul.com. I'm going to enter that. This is going to give me a list, if you have closed that customer at that point in time, it's going to give me a list probably of 100 plus emails. That's some whole other stuff. And calendar invite, the whole stuff shows up, right? Why? Because most of your communication runs through your email box. What I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the first 20. I want the first 20. Those first 20, I hang on the wall, I print out, including the calendar invite. I hang them on a the wall. You may recognize this, for those who do a product design, you may recognize this as a wireframe. Now when I hang these 20 up, I start looking at it. Did they come inbound? Or did we reach out to them? When did we have a meeting? What did we discuss in the meeting? Do I have my meeting notes still available? Oh, my meeting notes are still there. What did we talk about in the meeting? When the customer asked me for something in email, what did they ask for? When I sent the customer an, an attachment, which attachment did I send? 
Which document, which insight did I share? Through that, you have your first customer win. You have a dissected, here's how we want this customer. Now, if you have a few customers, two, three, four, five, six, you can do the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. By doing that a couple of times, you start to get the sense like, hey, every time we come, we sent the same thing, we sent the same now, we sent this. Now we start to get a sales process. A simple process. It doesn't need to be complicated, people. I start to see which documents we use. Now, some of the documentation, some of the content we're sending, you know, like expires over time. But there's a new form of that document. Something new comes out. What we essentially have started to do is we created what you would refer to as the customer journey. And this is a form of a true customer journey, but I like to encourage you to, or, or to realize that in today's world where I go online and I type the word customer journey, I do not get customer journeys. I get seller journeys with some funky customer colors and schemes over it. But it's funnels, it's stages, it's like all the same stuff. Customers don't go from stages. They don't call you up in the morning and say, Dutsky, I love your pitch yesterday. Can you move me from SQL to SEL? Right? They don't do that, right? And so you got to literally, they think differently. Okay. So that is an, an idea about how, where this comes in. Okay. I'm going to keep, uh, what, are we, what are we looking like on time, Renata? How, how much? Till what time does this go? Okay. I'll give it 10 more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. Two more minutes. Okay. Two thumbs up then. Last question then. 15. Oh, 15. Okay, great. 15 I can do. Okay. One more question. Next question. Yes, sir. Are you going to set me up like this the whole day through or what? Okay. Let me depict to you how we are treating, in this case, the question was, uh, you're talking about questions, is qu how, qu how important are questions asking, and how would you, we teach our sales team, if it's so important, how will we teach your people to ask properly questions? I'm going to tell you, it's not only important for sales, it's extremely important for customer success. It is even important for marketing. Pretty much anybody in the company needs to learn how to have a conversation and ask a question. I'm going to show you the basic skill set. And I tell you, within the next five to ten minutes, I'm going to show you what the difference is. You're going to be able to listen to calls. Now, there was a, what happened to me is I, at one point in time, I became a sailor. And I became a competitive sailor. We sailed, you know, like in the, in the Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area. And right before I went with my coach on the boat, he said, Jocko, after today, you will never look at wind the same way again. And that day, he taught me how, sail ripples over, how the wind ripples over water, different than it moves over the uh, feet above the water. And he showed me everything about how the wind works. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a TED session on what asking questions is about. With that, you probably can blow away 99% of all sales leaders in the world because they, don't even under, they have never been taught this. Because what I'm about to teach you, there's no class that this teaches other than the winning by design class. Here goes. First things first, if I want to teach something to anyone, you need to think that visualization of that concept is no longer a nice to have. The entire younger generation of population wants you to visualize everything that you explain to them. It is an absolute must. Whiteboarding is not a nice to have thing, it's a requirement. What I'm going to do down here, I'm going to create, first and foremost, the difference between an open ended and a closed ended question. A closed ended question has two answers, which would be yes or no. Now I'm going to expand the closed ended question slightly and say, what is your favorite color? Blue, yellow, green, that is also a closed ended question. Okay, single word answers are, are closed ended questions. Make sense? Now, what I'm then going to do, I'm going to ask an open-ended question. An open-ended question and generally starts with why, how. It asks for the process behind what a customer did. Example that I want you to remember moving forward of the combination of a closed and an open-ended is when I ask you, did you have a great weekend? What made the weekend so great? Oh, congratulations, the gentleman moved here. And so, the first question is, did you have a great weekend? Yes. 
what made it a great weekend? Now, the moment in time I ask him the open-ended question, he kind of like feels compelled to answer it because in the first place he already said that he had a great weekend. So he's not like, well, I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to sit there. I'm not saying. I'm going to say nothing. Yes, one in a hundred, you have a jack. You know what? And they're going to go that way. Fine. The other 99 are just going to comply and say, oh, I had blah blah blah. Close-ended, open-ended. If you're in sales, you cannot just be good at it. You got to have this like your second. This has got to be your native tongue. This has got to be super, super. Okay. Now that's level. So we got open-ended and close-ended question. The second thing that I have, we have what we call situational questions, and later on we have pain questions. Situational questions constitute how many servers do you have? What are your current infrastructure? How many people do work for you? How much revenue do you have? These are all questions. They're often closed-ended, and they ask a particular thing. You can recognize them because if your salesperson is asking four, five, or six of them all at the same time, then people go like, dude, you're interrogating me. I give up. So you can't ask too many situational questions, generally two or three. Now what you can do with, it, with situational questions, you can use your research. So instead of asking how many people do you have working for you, or how many people work in this pizza place, you perhaps could have seen somewhere online that four people were on the pizza place. Or if the pizza place was hiring, you don't have to say, are you hiring? You can say, I noticed on the door that you are hiring, did I get that right? Now I'm asking a close-ended situational question with knowledge. Remember earlier on I said we're going to do some research on your database? When that database is loaded with data, I actually can use that to ask close-ended, positive answered questions. Now, that is a situation question. A pain question often talks to you about the problem that you're having. Since you're running a pizza store, may I ask, are you happy with the increase in revenue per month? Since you're, since you're in the medical technology, may I ask, is the patient's survival rate to your liking? As soon as I ask that, I poke on something. I start to, to pull on something. And the customer goes like, ow, I don't like that. That's a pain question. Now, a pain question you cannot ask too many of because people don't like to be like, ow, poke, ow, poke. You're like, stop poking me, right? So we can in generally ask two or three situational questions, then one pain question, or maybe two pain questions. What we see down here, on the left axis, I got how engaged in the customer. On the horizontal axis, I have time. Watch what's going to happen. I'm going to say, customer, I'm going to ask situational question. May I ask how many you servers do you have? Two. What uh, are, which are you currently on Amazon? Or blah blah blah. I'm on Amazon. Um, are you using Excel spreadsheets? Yes. Oh, so if I got it right, you know, like, and what what are the pain? What is the pain that you're having? Oh, I can't scale my financial reporting. So if I got it right, you have Excel spreadsheets, you're currently having not a cloud solution, and that's causing you that pain. Did I get that right? Yes. What we see is we summarize, in this case, we summarize our findings. You ask the questions, you summarize. At the end of the summarization, you ask, did I get that right? Yes. Folks, just doing this right now, tomorrow, will already get you a little really advanced. Now, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna send you full cycle on this, okay? What is the number one thing that we do after this is oh, I have a solution for that pain. I got something. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna straight away pitch. I'm so excited. I got a solution for that. This is called solution selling. And what you see down here, this wave is a solution sales wave. It never really engages the customers fully. What you see here is 80% of all salespeople uses something like this methodology, and it is essentially your customers are not the better of it. Even heavily trained salespeople use this. Let me ask you what's the situation, you have this situation, oh, you caused that pain. Oh my gosh, we have a great solution for you. And here's the solution. Now, in order to break through for that, I have to go from this summary, I have to go up. Now, if I go up, I then ask simply, what kind of impact is this having on your business, this pain? As soon as I ask that, I'm up and I'm in the right domain. 
Okay? Now, there's a trick that we as salespeople know in order to how to induce that. That trick sits right here, for which we're going to use storytelling. This trick down here is as follows. So, if I got it right, you have 20 people submitting expense reports every month. You're currently using Excel spreadsheet to do that. What we notice is that 12%, you overcompensate and are overexpensing 12% and you're losing a lot of money on that. And as a result, you are having a negative impact on your growth. Summary, ask question, did I get that right? Customer, bingo, jackpot, exactly. Here it comes. Customer use case. You're not the first. I hear this all the time. Actually, it reminds me of customer use case XYZ storytelling inserted that ran this problem. The way how it impacted their business was ABC. May I ask, how does this impact your business? What we now have is we are making consultative selling the approach. This level-based, this way of visualizing question-based techniques requires something. I'm, I'm all the way up here in the right corner, okay? What I'm going to do right now is help you build this over the weekend that you can do this yourself. I give your value prop. Your value prop while you built the product. Your value prop while you built the product was built to create this impact. You ask anybody in the company, may I ask what is your customer name? What is the customer? And they give you a logo, Coca-Cola, whatever it is. Logos don't buy. Really, I've noticed it. I find it amazing finding. Logos do not buy. Then they give me a title of a person. Oh, it was the VP of IT. Folks, roles don't buy. I need to know a name in order to figure this exercise out. Who bought a solution from us? Oh, it was Juan. Okay. What was Juan's pain that he described during uh, buying? We give an idea. Oh, that was pain X and pain Y. What questions did we ask to get to that pain? Then I say, what situation did Juan in find himself in with? What I now get is I get all the things that I need to do here, 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 and here to get me to the summary. I have Juan as a success story already. I have the impact that he had. All I need to do is which question did we ask, turn it around, and I don't have a pitch, but I have a question-based diagnostic script. When we do this with 20 people in the room, and often they are like very experienced, I simply ask the most experienced person in the room to help me with this, then I go like, hey, is there anybody who started here yesterday? And they go like, oh, yes, I'm sorry, right? I'm just, I just came in new, right? Can you just ask these questions that we just figured out? Can you just run through that? Role play this out. And then we ask the rest of the group after that. What do you think? How did this sound? And everybody go like, wow. Yes. Process. Visualized. Step by step. That is how you get 10% improvement on the diagnostic part. This sees sales far more than just a gut feel that you can deal with. You know what? We're hiring people who've done it before. I don't need to hire people who've done it before. I need to hire people who are going to do it for me in the future. Because doing it 20 years ago in the old world ain't going to help me when I need it to be done right now. Because we're no longer a gut feel, big deal, superstar economy that uses the plus sign. We're a SaaS business that uses the multiplication, the science behind it, that runs as a process. Okay. With that, I'm going to give one, uh, one I'm going to give two key remarks, and then I'm going to, and we do this on this trip. I see right now on this trip, I see that in this case, uh, that men and women are pretty equally divided. We were previously this week at other locations where we saw that the workforce was equally divided, but that senior management roles were not equally divided. We have, I have raised my voice, as some of you who were there yesterday at, um, at Resultate Digitais, uh, I have started to raise my voice. This is unacceptable, and it's for the following reason. Politically, go for it. Knock yourselves out of the park, whatever you want to do. It's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm a business person. 
if we are excluding 50% of the population to help us progress the business on an executive level, then we are shortcutting ourselves pretty quickly because we need the best of the best. I don't just need the best men, I need the best women, I just need the best people, I don't care. But by the moment in time we exclude those, we are essentially putting our company right behind. What this creates is an incredible opportunity. And what we're trying to say to you, companies who are not adjusting to this, is like, look, if you start exposing and grouping your best females on from the population, and you include them into your company, that actually is a differentiator for you. Because most of your buyers are not just men. They are joined. This you need to understand. So I'm glad that we take it on as a political topic. I'm totally in, you know, also enamored with that. That's not the reason I'm here. I'm only here to talk about the business element of it. Like, to do the smart thing. That's number one. Number two, the number one problem that we are making and we're doing right now, we are forcing our younger generation, a.k.a. the millennials, and I don't like to use that word because generally when we use the word millennials, the next thing that follows is a form of an insult or something that is a punch underneath the ballot. So do not. I just try to call it younger generation. They're younger. What we're trying to teach them is volume-based, hard work, uh, work harder, not smarter. And it's the wrong thing to do. And I give you an example of how we, in, in this morning with the, fo with the team at Resultatos Digitae, a few simple things of what happened so you can understand. First things first, managers train. Younger generation doesn't like to be trained, likes to be coached. Because if I train people, who's the person with the knowledge? Me, in generally the central point of authority. Therefore, what we do to engage millennials is the opposite. We start a conversation. Of course I know the answer. I want to know, what do you think the answer is? And then I'm not going to give you the, oh, that's great, you did it right, boom. I'm going to say, what do you think about the answer that he just gave? Oh, I think you should do this one. And then I'm going to say, well, what do you think? I start a conversation. The best way to do that is through role play. So if I have this conversation in dialogue with two, and there's 15 people in the room joining, although him and I are role playing, the other 15 people are simultaneously learning from our role play. Now, this morning, as the, this team of Resultat Digital is doing that, I have the, the, the CRO and the, and the founder of the company sitting in this group. There's 12 managers in the, running this role play. Do you think that any of them, as we ask, pick another person to role play? Now, you pick a person to role play. You pick. Nobody picked you, and nobody picked Guillermo. None of them. And as you ask me, what do you think I can improve? You go like, hmm. Well, clearly your team doesn't dare to ask you to participate in the role play. This, in generally, is a sign of a hierarchical organization. And believe me, you know, like, she's really good, right? So you go like, oh my God. Like, because they don't dare to ask you, you run a form of a hierarchical organization. Because if it's an egalitarian organization, it's flat. Well, I am randomly picking people. So if I pick eight people and the group is 10, I clearly excluded the two executives. That's not an egalitarian. That's a hierarchical organization. They're afraid of it. This results in the following. Why does the manager want to do this? Because in generally, they don't want to fail in front of their audience. And because of that, the younger generation goes like, dude, if you cannot do my job, and I can trust you that you can do yours, I'm not going to be really comfortable with that. And so I ask in this case, and you, there's no better person in the world for you to do this who embraced it wholeheartedly. I said, you, fail in front of your team. Role play with them. Don't punish. Role play and fail. Because what we need to teach the younger generation is that failing is an excellent way to learn things. It is the absolute learning process. Now, I don't mean fail the process and throw the, 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 you know, torpedo the entire building into the ground. Let's be reasonable about that. But there's a number of mistakes that can be made that really don't cost a single thing, that the, per, the, the learning process is great. This needs to start with management. And management needs to learn that our younger generation needs to be given an opportunity to fail, that we therefore need to show them that failing is okay by failing ourselves. We can show that failing ourselves is okay by participating in the same exercises that they do as a team, 
for which then they then in return will reward you with their respect, which by no means make any difference on a hierarchical perspective. They still think that you're the boss. They still think that you need to be treated with the proper respect and dignity. There has no change in the impact on that. This is a way on how we need to start thinking about engage. This is just one of the ways how we need to start thinking and engaging our younger generation. Because what I see what they're doing is us, the older generation, have created the problem by working harder. And they need to challenge us by thinking smarter. With that, I'm going to give you, I uh, appreciate you guys, folks, coming forward today. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Music. <laughs>